lifted up in a prayer. Hallelujah. And we're going to welcome the man of God up here shortly after. Father, we give you praise. you look upon these tithes and offerings and let it be pleasing in your sight, O God. Let it be sweet smelling unto you. Let it offer sweet incenses, O God, unto your nostrils. Now look upon every family represented here, every bloodline, O God, and be glorified. Father, we thank you for the finished work of the cross. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that speaks better things than the blood of Abel, O God. Than that of Abel, O God. All glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand. We're going to welcome the prophet that the Lord has set before us. Let's just take about 30 seconds to pray in the Holy Ghost. Building ourselves up on our most holy faith. Come on, let's hear it. Lord, knowing that you make perfect intercession for the one that you've placed before us, oh God. The one that you have placed your word in, O oh God, that shall be ministered to us, O oh God. Father, give us the ear to hear, eyes to see, O oh God, the heart to discern your word this hour. Father, we thank you for the mighty anointing that rests upon this man of God. And we say, have your way. Have your way in this one tonight. All glory and honor and praise belong to your God. In the mighty name of Jesus, let's welcome our set man, Pastor Moses Anderson. Thank you for blessing. Hello, everybody. All right, all right, all right. God is good. So we're just going to do a quick reading, and then we will pray and get seated. And... Um, I just love the fact that uh, we get reminded here every now and again about the significance of the presence of God. I thank God for that charge that you brought, man, the leader, that was excellent. You know, because I'm telling you, um, we live in a world that is so commoditized. And what I mean by that is people always want you to come to them for things. So that becomes an excuse for them to advertise to you more or for them to take money from you. But we know that's not the way the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God is not inviting you to come and have fish. The kingdom of God is asking you to learn how to fish. You see, so that is the reason why we lay such emphasis, praise God, on knowing how to create the ambience of God's presence in your own home. You know, as we were coming in here today, just about a mile out, I was meditating in my heart, and my heart was meditating on a good theme. And what came out of my mouth, just not because I was pre-meditating it, so to speak, but I was just thinking about the goodness of God. And I heard myself say, how does one secure the presence of the Holy Spirit upon the sacrifice? You see, the Bible is saying, and the Holy Spirit of God came upon the sacrifice. You know, it is one thing for our hearts to be generous toward the Lord, to make a sacrifice, just as we're doing tonight. To leave all else behind to come before the presence of God. And yet it's another for the sacrifice to be acceptable. 
to have the Holy Spirit come upon that sacrifice. This is something that is critical for each and every one of us. When you take time away from watching TV shows, take time away from chit-chatting about all kinds of nonsense, take time away from engaging in political debates, to be in your closet, seeking the Lord, as we've just read in Psalms 149, in your bedroom. Guess what? It will be nothing if the presence of God does not come upon that sacrifice. And so we need to know how to induce that presence of God. We need to know how to engage Him so that we're not just spending time in solitary confinement, but that indeed we are alone with God. And so let me tell you something. It is something that cannot be overemphasized. You know why? Because if every one of us has an altar at home where we engage God, whenever we come together like this, there will be more of a sweet fellowship. Because every grudge that people, any kind of grudge that one may want to bring would have been taken care of at the altar. Any burden that one may want to bring would have been executed at the altar. So when you come, you come genuinely free by the Son of God. You come genuinely blessed by God. You see, because what you have is what you give. Having an altar of such in our homes is the reason why we've been going through the things that we're going through in these last days. The Lord made it very clear to us, particularly around the lockdown of 2020, that the reason why the church was going through what was going on in the world was so that we can fully press into the revival of Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom was such a man in the Old Testament where, who, in whose house the Lord found a place. The Ark of the Covenant was being taken from place to place upon its recovery. And the presence of God, which the Ark of the Covenant represented, did not find a place to stay except for the house of Obed-Edom. And the Bible says, and the Lord blessed him indeed. Let me tell you something, if we would recognize that God has given us an opportunity to have a reset of salt from all of the running around, all the helter skelter, to be alone in our homes, if we recognize that that is an opportunity for us to have a rethink of how we engage God, then we would have done well with all that two years that went by. But if we just spend the two years catching up on TV shows and reading novels, if we have spent the two years renovating our houses just without recognizing that it was a call to the revival of Obedidum, then we may have just blown it. But I pray that as many of us as are standing here today will have a fresh reawakening in our hearts to the tangibility and the potency of the presence of God. There is nothing like it. There is no substitute for the presence of God. You see, there are certain things that you may catch glimpses of here and there. In a conversation with Kenyatta, you may receive a revelation. In a conversation with Sheila or while they're singing, you may receive an insight into the things of God. But the fullness of the collective joy of salvation is found only in the presence of God. And so we need to learn how to cultivate that presence of God. It is very key. It is very important. And it doesn't happen just here. Praise God for when we come together like this for the corporate anointing. But the Bible says that sing aloud to God. Some translation says upon your beds. But in reality, what the Lord was saying is in your closet. I want to hear your voice. Don't just say, well, I'm the only one here. I don't need to make any sound. God hears my thoughts. If God is happy with just hearing your thoughts, then he wouldn't have given you a mouth. You understand what I mean? David tried it. It didn't work. He said, while well, I was silent, my bones grew weak within me. He said, now I will speak because I believe. If we truly believe, then what we will do, we will open up our mouths to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. If you want to have a practice, it's a good time for you to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. This very moment, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let it rain. Was that your key? Let it rain. Open the flood gates of heaven and let it rain. Let it rain. Open the flood gates of heaven and let it rain. Let it rain.
speaking and he was telling the people if they had known he was asking them that do you not know what it means when the father says I desire mercy over sacrifice this was what the Lord said through the prophet Hosea in Hosea chapter 6 verse 6 God was letting the people know that I appreciate your sacrifices I'm glad because you want to please me just like your father Abraham makes made a sacrifice just like the ones before you, he said, but I want you to know that I desire to show you mercy that I desire to receive your sacrifice. That's what it means. The Lord says, I desire. God is looking for more of an opportunity to show you mercy than to receive a sacrifice from you. You know, quite often the sacrifice is what you can bring. But mercy is what the Lord brings. The Lord is saying that there are many of us, we are not giving God enough of an opportunity for him to be God in our lives. When we mess things up, we focus too much on fixing the mess rather than letting him fix us. And you know what that does? Before the Lord, you appear as though you are a God to yourself. As though you want to pardon on yourself. You know that many of us begin to feel better with ourselves when we start to do better? That means the confidence that you have in your righteousness is in the works of your own hands. And God is there and is saying to you and I, now do you not see that even your works of righteousness are like filthy rags before me? God is saying, let me show you mercy. And so I want to encourage you folks, if there be anything in your life that you are so desperately trying to fix, ask yourself, what did God say to you about it? Many of us, until we ask that question, we will not even realize that we haven't spoken to God. Let's quickly look at 1219. We can pray and everybody here can go to their seats. Verse 19 of Matthew chapter 12. Look at what it says. And you may want to go read it more when you get home. But it says, he will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A Bruce Reed, he will not break and smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name, in his name, the Gentiles will trust. Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because once again we have come here, Lord, to enjoy the beauty of your holiness and the splendor of your love. We have come here rejoicing because of the sound of the invitation to come to your presence. Because we know therein lies the fullness of joy. Lord, as we are here today once again to receive through the ministry of your word, let our hearts be as fallow grounds, ready to receive with utmost meekness your engrafted word that is able to save our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's be seated. Thank you, guys. God bless you. God bless you real good. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. All righty. So, I'm sure many of you may have tried looking online for Saturday's message. Saturday last week, um, I'm hoping that people were trying to find it. I know that somebody asked me if it was up. 
Yeah, yeah we, we didn't, didn't put that message up as much as I would have loved to uh, because we had such a beautiful video, but no audio. And I'm not going to recommend for you to just sit there and just look at me. You see what I mean? Yeah. So that is the reason why we don't have it, but I just pray that as many of us as were here who were partakers of it firsthand will be able to share with others. I believe that maybe uh, Brother Greg or one or two other people may have the audio recording on their phones. It may not be the best quality, but it is, you know, something that you can um, make reference to. So um, this week, God willing, everything is going to be much better. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate that very greatly. Um, so here is the deal. What I would love to do or what I'm attempting to do at this point is to go over a couple of things that I shared on Saturday last week. Remember that Tuesday we were not here uh, because of the um, Thanksgiving holiday. We decided to just take that week off um, or just Tuesday. I mean, because this is still part of the week and we're here. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. And so Tuesday we weren't here, but I mean, Saturday last week, I started talking to us about, does anybody remember? Spiritual warfare. Understanding spiritual warfare. Now, I would love to get more into the assignment that I gave to y'all on Tuesday, but in case somebody's here that is so eager to let us know that they've done the assignment, can I see your hand up? If you've completed all three of the steps, you haven't completed it. Which one have you done? Water. Okay. All right. Tia, yeah, which one have you done? You're waiting for Tuesday. It's coming. Tuesday will be here before you know it. Alan, what have you done? Okay, you've done water and works. Now, for those of you wondering what's going on in here, um, on Tuesday, Tuesday, um, not Tuesday, I keep saying Tuesday, on Saturday, on Saturday, um, I asked if we would be happy to do some study on our own when it comes to certain fundamental principles that help to sharpen the discernment of the believer. Because we started talking about understanding spiritual warfare. One of the critical things about understanding spiritual warfare is discernment. You need to be able to discern what voices you're hearing in your heart. You see, when the devil comes, the Bible says Satan comes as an angel of light. He disguises himself as an angel of light and so do his messengers. The messengers of Satan would disguise themselves as angels of light and they would speak to you in such a voice and they would even quote scriptures to you in such a way that if you are not discerning, you will miss the twist that they place on scripture. One of the things that the devil does is the devil will quote scripture but put a question mark where God put a period. How was how did he get Eve? God told Adam that of, the, of all the trees in the garden, you may eat except for the tree of the fruit, except of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, and guess what happened? Satan came to Eve and said, did God really say? Yes, he did. End of story. But he takes discernment to know who is on your side and who is against you. You know, many times we have done things out of the goodness of our hearts because we truly believe that we have been led by the Holy Spirit. Or we truly believe that what we're doing is what the Word of God says. Unknown to you or unbeknownst to us, every now and again, we are hearing voices of familiar spirits. Now, if you haven't heard the message that I preached or the teaching uh, that I gave on familiar spirits, which happened a couple of weeks ago, maybe months now, I want to encourage you to go and find that message and listen to it. It is a message that I wish, to be honest, I wish that I knew 20 years ago. I wish that I heard this before. It would have saved me a lot of embarrassing situations. You know, because quite often, we go through a lot of embarrassing situations as children of God because of the fact that we fall for little tricks of the enemy. You see, the Bible says, do not be ignorant of the devices of Satan. 
God is not asking you to tremble at the power of Satan. Jesus says, all power has been given unto me. But what God wants you to be mindful of more than anything else are the wiles of the enemy, the devices of the enemy, the tricks and the pranks that he plays. You see what I mean? That is the reason why I said these things are embarrassing situations. Because as a believer, you find yourself in need. You find yourself lacking things. Isn't that embarrassing when your Father in heaven owns all things? The Bible says even the cattle upon a thousand hills. Quite often you, as a believer, you find yourself believing that you have to help yourself when the Lord God Almighty says your help does not come from the east, nor the west, nor the south, but it comes from the northern city of the great king, from the most high himself, the one who sits upon the throne, the father of all spirits and the God of all flesh. You see, we go through all of these things just because we are lacking in discernment, because if you are able to discern, you would not have followed the voice of the hireling. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and my sheep know my voice. But at the same time, he told them that there is one that looks like the good shepherd, but who in fact is the hireling. What is the difference between a shepherd and a hireling? A hireling, from the name, is somebody that gets hired to look after sheep. He doesn't care about the sheep. He cares about his own pocket. He shows up so that he can get paid. And he's on the clock. On the clock. Who does that remind you of? Satan. Satan is on the clock and he does everything that he does for himself. He said, but if you're not discerning, you will listen to the dictates of the Eileen and miss the voice of the Good Shepherd. So discerning is very key. And so one of the ways by which I have learned to sharpen my discernment is to compare spiritual with spiritual. I was explaining to a friend of mine the other day what it means when the Bible says that you need to be such a man of God that is schooled in scripture who knows how to rightly divide the word of truth. Because a lot of what is written in scripture was written in the, in, in, in the, in the Hebrew language where there were no vowels written down, only consonants. And so when you have a name like Abba Father, the A at the beginning and the A at the end aren't there, just two B's. So where do you put vowels? How do you know how to divide the consonants to put the vowels? That's what it literally means to know how to write the divide the word of truth. But the implied meaning of that to you and I today is how do I know exactly what the word of God is saying and how do I apply it? Do you know that I've spent the last two days, for a good part of the last two days, studying just one name in the Bible? The name Cain. The name Cain comes from two very distinct root words and one of them means two things depending on what situation and who is using it. You see, because if we don't do things like that, you know, I, have, I call myself a student of etymology, but the reason why is because the Bible says all things were made by the Word of God and without the Word of God was nothing made that was made. Words are very important, especially if they are the words that are spoken by your Heavenly Father. And so it is critical for us to know these things because if we do not apply ourselves to the knowledge of the things of God, Satan is always happy to take advantage of our ignorance. God is not concerned about the abilities of Satan. He is more concerned about the disability of the believer. That was why he said that my people perish not because of the horde of darkness. He said they perish for lack of knowledge. Ignorance is the enemy. I mean, of course, Satan is the adversary but what he does is he exploits our ignorance. And that was why Paul, in all of his ministry, he didn't joke with knowing more and more. Even after he had done all of those things, after he had been through all of those experiences, the shipwrecks, fighting the beast of Ephesus, what else did he say? After having led thousands and thousands of people to the Lord, he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Many of us, if we can just manage to lead two people to the Lord, ain't nobody tell you nothing. Nobody can tell you not anything. I mean, like, uh, who are you talking to? Do you not know that I was the first to arrive at church today? I prayed for somebody the other day who had a headache. And when I saw them like two weeks later, they were okay. And I'm like, obviously, most people's headaches don't last for two weeks. You see what I mean? But the moment people begin to enjoy such what you might even call progress, they become full of themselves. They think that they have known it all. But the reality is until we see him face to face, 
we are still learning. And that is the reason why we need to apply ourselves constantly. So when I give out assignments, or that rant, so to speak, is because I want you to know that when I give out an assignment, I am mostly giving out something that myself I've gone through or something that I have come to know in my walk with the Lord to be very beneficial to the believer. Do you know how many people here that the Lord has been speaking to very clearly and very expressly through the book of Matthew since the day that I said, study Matthew. But many of us, well, maybe not many, I know some of the people who watch the video haven't done it. But it is very critical. So let me just go over the assignment again. You will thank me later. If you would go through this assignment, I guarantee you, you will think, what I offer you is gold. And it's not for sale. The Bible says, come and buy, you who have no money. What did I tell you on Saturday? All God is asking you to pay for the most part is attention. He says, my son, incline your ears to my sayings. Because he's your father, he's not going to sell you an instruction. Just imagine if I, he just starts asking me questions about life, and I'm like, how much do you have? Yeah, you know? Just imagine if my wife is asking me, oh, how do you turn on this thing? And I'm like, ah, got you there. It's going to be $20, please. You know, that is not how it works in a family. The Bible says, freely have you received, therefore freely give. So the only thing that you need to pay when it comes to the things of God is to pay attention. You understand what I'm saying? Let me tell you this. I am one of those people, I don't pay for conferences. You can be spitting fire. If, if I want to watch someone spitting fire, I'll go to Vegas. The magicians there, they're doing it better than you. And then at least I will know that I'm paying for a wild time. I'm supposed to be the pretend presence of God. This is my conviction. If we are following the word of God as we should, this message of the gospel that we preach should produce for itself in the line of obedience the resources that are due. That is what happened for 4,000 years of history. This Bible was written to cover about 4,000 years of history and they didn't have to pay for a conference. When they were getting ready for the revival meetings in the wilderness, Moses, the Bible says, he turned the people back after a while. He says, you people have given too much. They gave enough generously as they are proposing their hearts for the building. If what you are preaching has not produced for you and I have to pay for the venue that you are using and your microphone, then maybe you don't have anything at all. You have to stop getting fooled and bamboozled by people who are recklessly fulfilling their ambition in the name of the commission. Jesus said, I send you out as sheep amongst wolves. He says, you go out there and preach the gospel. Do not even take your money back for yourself. Because the moment you take your money back for yourself, you are attempting to pay yourself for the work that you are doing for God. And God is like, so what is my use? Who's the employer here? Anita or the Alpha? If God is sending you, He says, don't take money back, don't take even, don't, don't take anything, let's go. Because everything that you need is along the way. Let me tell you something. Jesus said, by the fruits, you shall know them. If God cannot pay for it, or if God doesn't pay for it, that's probably because He didn't ask for you to do it. So I want to officially announce to you, in the name of Jesus, stop paying for conferences. Because let me tell you what is going on. The hireling is sharing the sheep. The way you watch sheep shares here is fleecing the sheep. Because the enemy knows that people were made by God to be like sheep because God himself is the good shepherd. God designed us to be like sheep. Yeah. A friend of mine likes to call me a sheep. He says, every time there's a new technology, you're like, take my money, take my money. He says, you know you're like a sheep. I said, well, you who is the goat, what do you have to show for it? You be here. Your phone is so old, it's almost making your fingers bleed and you're calling me a sheep. I'm enjoying life. 
The Bible says love believes all things. Oh yes, call me gullible. But I would rather be gullible in faithfulness than to be suspicious of everything that is going on. And so because God intends for us to be sheep, Satan wants to take advantage of, of that. And that is the reason why people will make announcements such as, oh, we're having this conference, and if you want to sit up close to the front, it's $250. If you want to sit in the middle, is this, is that. And I'm like, okay, what is the basis for this calibration based on the word of God and the experiences that we have had of God in the past? Let me tell you something. All of that is worldliness. Let us call it what it is. The way of the world is such that the people who have stuff want everybody else to pay for the stuff that they have. And most times, what do we find? What they think they have. Have you not listened to all of these motivational speakers out there? Have you ever heard, heard them say anything that is of value, that is not from the Word of God? They, they lift things from Scripture. And do not put the reference. In fact, I remember many, many years ago, there was this linguist who said that originality is remembering perfectly what you heard, but not where you heard it from. That is the life and the lies that these motivational speakers are living. They take things from the Word of God, the principles that govern life, and they delete the references. They will not tell you that it was King David who said it. They will not tell you that it was John who declared it on the island of Patmos. They will not say that it was God who revealed to Jeremiah by his, by his angels. They will just say that as though it is coming from them. Because if they don't use what's in the word of God, it will never work. Let me tell you something. Nobody gets anything to work in this life that is not based on the principles of the word of God. But then they take that which they have received free and they monetize it. It's a Canaanite system. It is what a Canaanite system is, a worldly system. You know what I mean? But again, so I say all of that to say, I guarantee you, if y'all pay at the door to come in and I ask you to do an assignment, most people will do it because of the fact that I paid for it. They're like, I'm not going to let my money waste. I'm going to do everything that is in the curriculum. That is what we do when we pay for courses. Many times people have said to me, wow, all of this teaching, why don't you just create a school? Why don't you have a curriculum who will help you polish it over? I used to get those text messages like every other week. They would text me, who want to help you write a book, who want to help you package a curriculum, who want to help you do this, you can sell these courses. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Buy the truth and sell it not. Now, of course, the Bible says the ones that communicate, communicate to you with spiritual things, you communicate to them with material things, but there is, a, there is a caveat to that. And what is the caveat? Let everyone give as he or she has proposed in the heart, not grudgingly, nor of necessity. You are not supposed to give out of necessity. But for me, that has already received a gift from God to teach, necessity is placed on me to divulge the information. But the moment that I put a gate, and I said, pay for it. I am muzzling the ox. But let us, let us take it as seriously as though we have paid for it. Because Jesus paid for it. That's what our parents used to tell us when we were at school. When we, when we get reported for missing classes. Can you even believe that me, I, I would miss class? Yeah, sometimes I think I, I come across as somebody who would not miss class because I love information, but I would miss class. Yeah, enough for my parents to be invited to school to talk about it. In fact, I went to a private school and my mom's uncle was the principal, was the founding principal of the school. And so I got away with a lot of stuff because every time he saw me through the window being silly, I would remind him of my dad because they all grew up in the same neighborhood. And so he would just smile it off. But then after a while, it became so serious that we had to talk about it. One day he was like, how come you are always sitting in the garden. Because we had the garden in the middle of school, so if you didn't want to be in the classroom, you could just go there and hang out. We used to call it the park. He said, how come you're always sitting there? I said, because I have free periods. He said, show me your timetable. I didn't even have one. I was guessing my way through that semester. I didn't even know what my classes were. I just went in when I felt like. You see what I mean? And so eventually when he got to my father's attention, he said, you don't take it seriously because you don't pay for it. He said, but I, Pay for it. And 
that is exactly what happens when it comes to the things. It's the same thing applies to the things of the kingdom. Many of us don't take seriously these words because we didn't pay for it. Do you know some things written here were paid for by the blood of some other men? When you read the testimony of some of the people now, you're like, oh my God, God is good. But man, when they were penning down these things, their lives were made more difficult than hell for your sake. The Bible says all scripture was given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, committed to faithful men who loved not their lives unto death. And it is for the edification of the church, the perfecting of the saints, that the young man may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. If you're looking for that in the Bible, it might be tough. That's why five scriptures together. Because sometimes the way I quote scripture, someone is like, hmm. When I didn't see it like that in the epistle of John, yeah, it's because part of it is from the book of Second Peter. But how would you know when you don't study? But if you study and you are familiar with scriptures, let me tell you something. The reason why, and I'm going to share, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. The time is coming very soon wherein we will have plenty of time to study the things of God. And that is the reason why the Lord is preparing us with these nuggets. You know, we've started now for a couple of weeks wherein the very first half of my message, sometimes if not uh, the first half, Three quarters of it centers around how to further equip yourself as a believer. Why are we doing that? Why is the Lord leading us in that direction? Simply because we have had a generation of consuming believers who do not know how to bear fruit. They just know how to buy bread. Let me say that again. We have had a generation that is still running hammock outside of believers who know only how to buy bread. They do not know how to bear fruit. What they know is they go from conference to the conference. They buy books. And some of them even read the books. But when you look at them, you know that I have visited people and I'm sure you have to. You know the reason why you're at their house and you look at the shelf, their bookshelf, and you're like, why am I here? If you have all these books on the shelf, you have a book on the shelf that says understanding, godly communication in marriage, but we are here to settle a quarrel. And it's like, do you not read these things? We are here because of the fact that you are under so much burden as a family, but that is Kenneth He again, understanding the anointing. Does the Bible, has the Bible not said that the anointing breaks the yoke? So if you have this book, why do you have this problem at the same time? Simply because Children of God are supposed to be wise, but they have become worldly. What is worldliness? Worldliness, by definition, is doing things the way the world expects you to do it. The world expects you to pay for everything because we're in a Gentile Canaanite system that enslaves everybody. They want you to pay for everything. And that is the reason why we are marketed so much. We have been so conditioned to be consumers. When you have a headache, somebody wants to make money from a headache. The next thing that comes to your mind is CVS, Walgreens, how about buying some time off? But why can't you lay that hand on your head and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed? Because ain't nobody making money from your healing. But someone is going to make money from your panic. Think about it. When you are whole and of a sound mind, nobody makes money. But when you are depressed, the therapist. The, psychi the psychologist, the psychiatrist, apart from John. It's John's birthday today, actually. Yeah. Yeah, apart from John, because you know, John will pray for you, not just tell you theory. Okay, and we know that because we've seen his fruits. But I tell you what, that is because that is the way the world is designed. You want a system that works, you pay for it. I'm an immigrant, I can tell you. Tens of thousands of dollars just to live in America. And you pay for everything. You pay for good governors, good roads, electricity that is on all the time. The world system makes you pay for everything. Nothing is free. But some of us don't know it because we're born into the system. Somebody else paid for it and we just showed up and we take it for granted. You see, but many believers or many people who are supposed to be children of God, believers are worldly in their thinking and what does it mean? They want to pay for everything. They don't know how it works and they don't care. 
Most places when you go to, people don't know how to generate anything. They don't know how to generate electricity. They don't know how to purify water. They don't know how to grow vegetables. Why should I? When I switch it on, it comes on. At the end of the day, month, I pay, I pay for it. At the end of the day, I pay for it. But the kingdom of God does not work like that. And that is the reason why many of us have become impoverished when it comes to the things of God. Because the things of God don't work like the supermarket works. You don't just go and point and say, oh, I want more of the anointing, $50. I want more of patience, 100 bucks. I want more of forgiveness, so that one is a million dollars. Because forgiveness can be so hard sometimes. If you're paying for it, based on the number of people, you have to save up for it. It's like a mortgage. Oh, yeah. Because let me tell you something. What drives up the prices of things? The demand for it. And look at the demand for forgiveness and what? Let me tell you something. The Roman Catholics attempted to sell us forgiveness. They did for a couple of decades and people were buying it. They were selling forgiveness cards. Yeah, because there was a time that bandits were trying to take over most of Europe. And so a lot of people could not go to the Vatican City to worship and take their offering. And so because they weren't coming, the Pope was like, the money is running low. What do we do? Make forgiveness cards, send it to different parts of the world so people don't even have to travel. They don't have to deal with bandits. So if you know you're going to commit sin, where you're going, there is another card that you pay for that is about one and a half times the regular forgiveness card. You all know these things, right? Please don't just take my word for it. Look it up. It was happening in this world. So if I was going to someone's house and I would fight them, I would choose the other card, which was more money. Because that was premeditated sin. So when I, when I tell you that the world system teaches us to pay for things, it has come into the church, not just today, for a long time. And that is the reason why we don't even notice that we are paying for things that have been freely given. So the question in your mind then is, how then do we acquire these things that cannot be bought with money? It's very simple. The Bible says that by grace have we been saved. Through faith, not of works. You just need to believe. Jesus says, only believe. And the moment you believe, do you know the reason why you don't study the word of God as you should sometimes? Because you don't believe. If you truly believe that your life depends on this word of God, you will spend six hours straight studying it. And you will do that on a regular basis. You would delete some people from your phone because they take too much of your time because you now believe that you need to meditate upon it day and night. The reason why we don't acquire the true riches of the kingdom that cannot be bought with dollars is because we don't believe in those things yet. The moment you believe in those things, guess what? You start to align yourself in such a way that no expense is too much for you to pay for these insatiable treasures. These things are invaluable. Let me tell you something. There is a dichotomy between the world and the church. And there are four principal things that I like to use in teaching people the difference between the kingdom of God and the world. The number one thing is this. The kingdom of this world is always attempting to get you to do something for yourself. The kingdom of God is all about doing something for others. The kingdom of this world wants you to pay money for things. The kingdom of God wants you to believe for things. The kingdom of this world wants to teach you to focus on the things that you can see. The kingdom of God focuses on you walking by faith and not by sight. And the number four is my favorite. The kingdom of this world wants you to be convinced that you deserve things. But the word of God and the kingdom of God wants you to recognize that it is all a free gift. You cannot earn the true treasures of this life. Do you know how many hours you would have to work to pay for air if there was a price tag on it? <laughs> Think about it. Look at how much air you consume in one day. Even you, not talking about people like me with bigger size drawing pipes. I'm glad it's free. Otherwise, I may be working all day just to pay for air. Yeah, I know they made movies about paying for air. But I tell you one thing, that when Jesus established his church, one of the very first things that we saw 
was that God gave the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, the Bible says when the day of Pentecost, verse 1, was fully come, and they were all together in one place and in one accord, verse 2, there came out of heaven a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the room where they were in. And there appeared upon each and every one of them divided tongues as of fire, and they began to speak in a new tongue. Let me tell you something. All of that was the best gift the world had ever received. Someone says, I thought Jesus was the best gift. Yes, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. And the coming of the Holy Spirit was better for you and I than having Jesus remain in the flesh because he can only be in one place at one time. Even though the resurrected Jesus was very quick, he moved around very quickly, but he was still one place at one time. But now imagine we have the Holy Spirit that lives in our hearts, goes home with you, rides in your car with you, except for those days that you refuse to clean your car because I don't believe the Holy Spirit likes to any places. But at the end of the day, one thing that I do know is this. Oh, no, no, if I'm, I say that jokingly, but I mean it very seriously. Yes, we had a, I had a school principal once who used to say cleanliness it was next to godliness. And I'm telling you, don't just guess if it's true or not. Practice it. Wake up one day, if you haven't done this before, and clean your house. Don't just tidy up. Clean up. You know what tidying up is? Tidying up is picking up all your dirty laundry and shoving it into a basket, covering it and putting weight on it so that it doesn't overflow. Right? Packing all the trash in your kitchen and putting it in the trash bin and then covering it up. That is tidying up. Everything looks tidy. Tidiness is not next to the godliness. It is cleanliness. Cleanliness means to remove every unwanted things and every misplaced thing. And so when you have things in your house, shirts that you haven't worn for four years, and it's still there. It's not meant to be. Give it away. You understand what I mean? Dirty laundry is not meant to be on the floor. Neither is it meant to be a laundry basket for two weeks until the place starts smelling like a dead body came in into your house and decided to hide there. No, wash it. Clean up one day. And then try to pray that night. You will be amazed at how clearly you begin to hear from God. Not just take my word for it. Do it. Let me tell you something. I have tried to pray to God in a messy room and he told me as clearly as you can hear me that I needed to clean up first before we had a meeting. And then, see, I'm a man who hears God and I have fruits to show for it. So if I'm telling you the Lord said to me, in here, I was like, yeah, why not? And then I looked around and I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. Let me tell you something. For someone like me, it's more serious. And I tell you why. The Bible says to whom much is given, much is expected. The Lord called me a prophet. And part of the prophetic is that we smell things, we hear things, we see things. When I was little, people would visit our house and would question some of my actions. Because I would tell them, wait a minute, there's someone at the gate. We had a huge compound. And so it takes you being by the window or outside on the porch to hear if someone is by the gate or unless they're really banging it. And then I would say someone is at the gate and the people visiting would be like, oh, come on, your gate is too far from here for you to hear it. And my siblings would say, if he says it, someone's at the gate. Because of my hearing and the things that I would smell, I can smell people's socks without them taking off their shoes. It's a blessing, but sometimes it can be a curse if you know what I mean. And there are times where I smell people's attitudes. I smell people's behavior. Sometimes I can just smell if someone does not have good intentions. Because everything has an aroma. Can I prove that to you? The Bible says all things that men do is like an aroma to the Lord. Some of them are sweet smelling while some of them are foul. That is the reason why even the prayer of the wicked is an abomination to God. When the wicked, even though they brush their teeth with all the fluoride in the world, when they open their mouths to pray, God says, mm, this smells bad. Everything has a smell. All things that men do under the sun is like an aroma. Some of it good, some of it bad. And so I would smell things. In fact, after a while, I had to kind of like, 
downplay the ability to hear certain things because I was hearing things that was bothering me. You all know the story. Some of you know the story. Up until I was about the age of six or seven, I was always in and out of hospitals simply because I would suffer convulsion because of the things that I would see and hear in the realm of the spirit. For the first five, six years of my life, the natural world and the spirit world were very intertwined. Sometimes I just picked up and I started running in the house and there's nobody. The next thing my mom started looking for her car keys because a few minutes later I'll be running a temperature because the little boy that I was could not contain the intensity of the things that I saw. They prayed, they did all kinds of things. Sometimes I wish they didn't because I'm like, man, I would love to be able to see like that. Again, but thank God because there's a place and a time for everything. But I say all of that to let you know, folks, that if we would pay attention to the things that God has said, he is more eager than you are to speak to you. God wants to show you mercy that you can never beg for mercy. He wants to show you his kindness that you then you can never plead for it. And all he's asking you to do is just come, just show up, pay attention, believe. I don't even know why I started talking about cleanliness. Maybe somebody just needed to hear that. But this is what I'm going to say. And I'm going to go back to the assignments that I gave to you. When we're talking about understanding spiritual warfare, we need to first of all understand one thing, that we are always at war. You see, the Bible says there was war in the heavens. The heavens are eternal. There is no time. It's timeless. So if anything is in heaven, it's always on. No day, no night. It is always on. And so there is always war. That explains it. That explains why no matter how, how dedicated I am to the things of God, there is always another voice within me, within my members, telling me to do that which is contrary. The Bible says the spirit was against the flesh, and the flesh was against wars, against the spirit. So that I do not know what to do sometimes. I always feel like I am caught in the middle. Because of all these competing forces. But guess what? The world does not tell you those things because if you are aware of the spiritual warfare that is going on, nobody, not a man, can rule your life. But people want to rule over you. The Bible says the lords of the Gentiles or the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them. And so let's go back to this dichotomy of worldliness and the kingdom of God. When Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was coming in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came. When the Holy Spirit came, it was the most precious gift that had ever been given. And guess what? Automatically, people wanted to monetize the Holy Spirit. We saw the man that was called Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer was ministered to by Philip and a host of other people. And the Bible says that it was numbered amongst the believers because he believed. Many of us, when we get saved, we believe because without believing, you cannot be saved. So Simon the Sorcerer was saved because he believed. But guess what happened? He did not renew his mind. He did not allow himself to start looking at the world. The experience of Simon the Sorcerer is like the experience of the wife of Lot. Even though the angel of the Lord had delivered them out of Sodom, she could not let go of Sodom in her heart. She looked back to the region of Sodom and Gomorrah and she became a pillar of salt. The reason why she became a pillar of salt is because the water that is in the presence of God is a saltless water. The water that is on the outskirts of the world is a salty water. So that is the real difference. Oh, did I just give you one of the first answers? Ah. Somebody must have been praying. Wow. So the first assignment that I gave to you was what? Find the difference between the water and the waters. Because the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 7 that the Lord created the firmament within the, there was a firmament in the midst of the waters to separate the waters from the waters. Right? And then what did we read in Genesis 1 7? That was, I think, 1 4 is the one that I quoted. But there was something in 1 7 that I gave to you as an assignment. Um, yeah, because that he made the firmament yeah, that's the same one, to divide the waters from the waters. And the assignment was, do you know the difference between the waters? Okay? So the difference between the waters and the waters is that the waters above is masculine and the waters below is feminine. So the water above is a seed bringing water. The water below is a seed receiving water. So since I've already told you about that one, I'm only going to demand the other two that I haven't told you. 
Okay? So that's one of the major differences, the fact that one of them is salty and the other one isn't salty. So one of the ways by which you know the things of the world is that the salt is in the water. You understand what I mean? The salt is in the water. And so when you look at what God was saying about the gift of the Holy Spirit, Simon the sorcerer, who had seen the gift of the Holy Spirit, was like the person who had been delivered from the world, like the wife of Lot who had been brought out of Sodom, who was supposed to go and receive a free gift. But she couldn't let go of the merchandising that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was a place of merchandising. They were always buying and selling. Recently, the Lord led me on a study of the four regions. There were four settlements that made this, the, the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the things that they were known for was they were known for always selling things to people. Let me give you an example. From, from the Jewish history records, there was a time that one of the, the, the chief servant of Abraham went down to one of the regions of Sodom and Gomorrah because they were looking for Ishmael. And when they got there to the region, somebody punched him in the face with a stone in his hand and his head started to gush out blood. And the guy was like, pay me. He was like, wait a minute, you just hit me with a stone and you're asking for payment. And he said to him, that is the way it works around here. I have just delivered you of bad blood. You have to pay me for that service. So when you see people who read the Bible just like you read the Bible, but because they go like the Berean Christian to consult various historical sources and scripture, they get it more than you do. Because you just read when the Bible says that, you know, the kingdom of God is done in buying and selling. And you're like, I mean, really? What does that have to do with that? No, it has to do with Sodom and Gomorrah because that was what they did. They charged you for everything. If they slap you, they will charge you because we have just allowed for you to scream and exercise your voice. Pay! Now, I said that intentionally because I know some of you think it's ridiculous. But we are part of a system that is built on ridiculous. You buy a piece of land, and every year, you still pay for that land, even though you own it. Most of us pay for water. Most of us pay for light. And you're paying for light for somebody who did not bring light into this world. The Bible says, naked each one of us came into this world, and naked shall we return. The Bible says, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. And we think Sodom and Gomorrah was ridiculous. No, we're living in it. This, this civilization, if we can even call it a civilization, wherein we get to pay for everything. So when the Holy Spirit came, Simon the sorcerer was still looking at the methods of the world, like the wife of Lord. He still was looking back. And so what did Peter say to him? Because this dude, he came to Peter. He was like, uh, bro, <laughs> um, I've done very well for myself. As you know, I'm a magician. And everybody in the region of Philippi come to my shows. You know, the Bible says that he was somebody that was well known in that area. And everybody would come and watch him perform. So he was a big boy in town. And he had money. He says, look, don't worry about money. I have money. You name your price. I just need that gift of the Holy Spirit. And Simon the sorcerer did not die. He just became a pillar of salt. And what I mean by that is he had children. How do I know that? Look at how many people around you today who pay for the things that are free. The gospel is free and yet people pay to go and listen to somebody. The gospel is free and yet people pay to go and attend some kind of class based on scripture. Let me tell you something, if we are structured correctly in the body of Christ, none of the teachings of the word of God should we ever have to pay for. Yeah, one of my cousins a while ago, he was complaining to God of how broke he was. He says, God, I am preaching and teaching several times a week and I am broke. And God said to him, he says, maybe you need to change what you're teaching. He says, because I am the God that gives you the power to get wealth. He says, if you teach them 
my word as you should their hearts will be soft toward me and toward you and their hands will become generous and they will bless you and that was what happened he started to teach the principles of the word of god as opposed to what all the pastors around were teaching and everything was transformed if we do it right we don't have to beg if we do it right we don't have to cajole people we don't have to sell people on building fund every year there are churches in this town one of them i know very well every year they are raising money for building sometimes twice a year and when you ask the pastor what's going on it was like well see these people when they're tired of giving they will leave and fresh people will come who don't know that's what we do and that's why you go there every time you go there new faces because the people who have gone the first time the second time after a while they're like ah this is what this is about i'm moving on he doesn't mind because fresh goons will come and they will tap into those people's pockets too and then they move on they are paying for what is free simon the sorcerer was doing the same and you know what statement peter made peter spoke by the holy spirit and he said to him he said as long as you're thinking like that simon you do not have a part in the kingdom of god your money perish with you He's telling him, your money belongs in the sea. It belongs in the water of the world. That is the world system. In this kingdom, we do not do that. So let's just say that today I took a break from continuing on the, um, what's the subject? Spiritual warfare. But I want you to go do that assignment. It's going to help all of us together. What's the second thing? The second thing is what? Know the difference between the dead and the dead so for those people who were not here the first assignment i just spoke about it is knowing the difference between the waters above and the waters beneath Alrighty. so still work on it still do it because i haven't told you everything that needs to be known about the waters above and the waters beneath there is a lot you see but let me give you an insight okay every time i talk about it i give you further insight the end goal what i really want you to get out of understanding the difference between the waters and the waters is the potency of the word of god if you understand what the waters on the ground what that does to you then you will appreciate what the water that is coming from above what it does to you the water of the world takes things from you the water that comes from above brings things to you the bible says as rain comes from heaven without returning until it has blessed the earth so does my word that proceeds from my mouth it never returns to me void until he has performed the purpose for which i sent it right so when you understand the waters the water that's coming from above as opposed to the water that's coming from here then you will understand how to put a shoreline between you and the world and open your heart to receive the rain that is coming from above does that make sense the second thing is understanding the difference between the dead and the dead. Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. Those are not two deads. They're two different deads. And the third one, did you say you did that one? Which is what? Understanding the difference between the works that save and the works that shame. The works of unrighteousness puts you to shame, but the works of bearing the fruits of the Spirit bring you to the glory of God. You need to understand the difference between those two. But because of the fact that I believe I have a couple more minutes, I want to tell you something as a continuation of where we left off on Saturday about spiritual warfare. When Jesus started his ministry, his heavenly father and your father, by his Holy Spirit, led him into the wilderness that he may be tempted of Satan. Where did we start from? We started from Matthew chapter 4. And Matthew chapter 4 talks about how Satan came to tempt Jesus by asking him, first of all, to turn water into bread. And we analyzed that particular temptation. And one of the things that we focused on was the significance and the importance of recognizing that the need for the word of God is more important than any other need that your flesh can have. And how to be able to say no to the dictates of the flesh so that you can obey the word of God. Why? Because the Bible says the one that you yield your members to obey, the same are you a servant to. In Romans chapter 6, in Romans chapter 7, it says it repeatedly across those two chapters that whatever you obey, you serve. What was the reason? Why, why was Adam, why did Adam and Eve become subject to Satan? Adam and Eve in the day that they were made, 
it is said that even the angels were afraid to look at them because they were radiating the same light that they had seen from the throne of God. That was the reason why they did not need any clothing because they were encapsulated in the light of God's glory. Angels could not look at them. Have you not read in the presence of God that the angels that are closest to the throne of God, the cherubim, they, had, they have six wings, four extra wings. Why? Because the glory of God is so intense that they cannot even set their foot down in the presence of God. It will burn. So they have wings that cover their legs and then they've got another pair of wings that cover their face and with another, the third pair, they flew. And so when God made Adam and Eve, angels could not even look at them. Animals did not even stand a chance because they were so glorious. So guess what happened? The reason why Satan was able to have preeminence over them was because they obeyed Satan when he told them to eat of the fruit. When God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit, he said that to them because he wanted it to be that between he, God, and the man, there was a chain of command that says you obey only me. The moment you obey another, that person comes between you and I. That is the order and the hierarchy of things. Things rise and fall upon the earth by density. But in the kingdom of God and in the realm of the spirit, things rise and fall by obedience. You know, in this life, if I threw it up, I'm not throw up my phone. Let's find something that I can throw up, that can fall. I love you, but I don't want to be. Okay, yeah, let's let's use that. The yeah, only man and leader we have a pen that looks like this. Alrighty, there you go. Thank you, man and leader. If I throw this thing up, it comes down. Why does it come down? Yeah, the world will tell you gravity. Okay, that's the reason why you can't believe everything they say. The world will tell you gravity. I'm a physicist. Gravity doesn't exist because every time I'm doing, and every time you're solving a problem in math or physics, you introduce gravity, you always have to cancel it out somewhere else. And it's like, why do I introduce it just to cancel it out? Okay, and so if you, this is the first time you're hearing me speak on the subject, ask yourself, if gravity exists to pull everything down, how come a flame burns upwards? And it's like, ooh, oh yes. Because if gravity is the reason why everything falls, when you light a candle, the flame should be burning downwards because gravity is pulling it. And then when you challenge the, profes the professors, they will say, oh, that's because the flame is lighter than air. Boom. It's not burning upwards because of gravity. It doesn't defy gravity. It burns upwards because it's lighter than air. When you ask them, how come the hot air balloon rises? How come when you fill a balloon with helium, it rises? Shouldn't gravity pull it down? They're like, oh, it's lighter than the air. So that is the reason why it rises or falls, because it's lighter. So it's not gravity, it is density. And that's what the Bible says. The Bible says deep calls to deep. That is density. Deep calls to deep. He's talking about water. When you have something in water, the water finds its level simply because of density. Density cancels out when you're dealing with water. And that tells you everything you need to know. But then at the end of the day, if I throw this thing up, I know that it always comes down. Right? That is very fundamental. That is basic. Thank you, man. Later, let me give this back to you. So, that translates very seamlessly into the way hierarchy works in the kingdom of God. As true and as basic as density is on the earth, in the realm of the spirit, what determines whether you rise and you keep going or you fall is your ability to obey a higher rank than you. The moment you obey something that is at a lower rank than you, guess what? You take the place of that thing and that thing takes your place. You understand what I mean? Adam obeyed Satan and Eve. And that was how Satan was able to take the place above them. Now, we, we talk about that all day long and we're like, oh my goodness, Adam, why did he do that? He would have just said, no, I'm not hungry. And we wouldn't have to deal with all of this. But even us, every day, we do the same thing. 
we obey our thirst so when jesus was tempted by satan jesus was like ah nah 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 man shall not live by bread alone i'm not supposed to be concerned about what satisfies my flesh i'm supposed to obey the word of god but the holy spirit reminded me and asked me to introduce y'all to something that is even more fundamental than resisting the urge to satisfy your flesh and you know what is more fundamental than that let me show you it's in isaiah chapter 24 so this is about the only thing i'm going to say on this subject because of time we're going to wrap up but i hope i've been able to remind you and to challenge you that indeed there is still a lot to study and every one of us until we see the lord jesus in the blue skies and we are caught up to meet with him to receive immortality we need to continue to spend as much time as we can studying the word of god learning the vocabulary with which we can converse with the father of light let's see isaiah 24 I believe it is I want to read to you the story of Satan and um, hold on one second I, Isaiah 14 I beg your pardon Isaiah 14 verse 13 many of us know this story we can recite it by heart from verse 12 in my bible is titled the fall of lucifer this please i want you to open your mind this very moment pray that god will open your eyes to see the moment you see this it becomes increasingly difficult for satan to get you look at what he says how are you falling from heaven this question is very critical very very important what do we know about spiritual warfare the very first record of war that we have was when satan and the third of the angels in heaven that he had deceived when they were kicked out by michael with the help of god they were kicked out of what heaven that was the very first war to be fought and when that war was fought the result of it was that satan fell fundamentally whenever there is warfare somebody falls until somebody falls the war is not over it might be a truce it might be a, um, a ceasefire but the war is not over for the war to be over somebody needs to fall so every time you are in spiritual warfare what you need to avoid is to be the one that falls very simple right so whenever you are looking to please god and your flesh is coming to be in the way you've decided oh this week i am going to fast and then by 8 a.m. in the morning, your intestines are singing choruses and begging you for a cup of coffee and a smoothie. What do you do? For you to win in your commitment, what do you do? You do not fall for the dictates of your belly. Because the one you obey becomes the Lord. So when you obey your belly, your belly becomes the Lord. And so you cannot advance beyond your belly. And your belly only receives food, but you receive and need the word of God. And so you worry, you wonder why you don't hear the voice of God as clearly the rest of the day because the flesh is between you and God because you've made yourself subject to the flesh. Everything rises and falls by density in the kingdom of God is by obedience to the rank that is above you. So the moment you obey the rank beneath you, you have what? Falling. Right? The thought of the angels in heaven decided to obey Satan. They fell. Satan himself, who did he obey and why did he fall? If you can understand what was driving him and what drove him out of heaven, he will no longer be able to drive you out of the will of God. Because the Bible says what you have is what you give. The enemy can only treat you like he treated himself and can only get you to fall the same way he fell. He knows no other way to fall than the way that himself fell. 
and I'm going to maybe on Tuesday apply this principle to a couple of temptations in the Bible and then you will see that if you apply this thing to every temptation you will not fall so let's read on the Bible says how have you fallen from heaven so this is the story of how Satan fell oh Lucifer son of the morning how you are cut down to the ground you who weakened the nations when the Holy Spirit told me this one I was like I never knew it I thought weakening the nations was only referring to the fact that Satan is going around now deceiving the nations but what happened was before he fell this was talking about before he fell before Satan fell he was called an anointed cherub the one the only one who was situated to and positioned for his wings to cover the throne of God he was so beautiful that other angels can sit all day and just look at him every part of him made music that's what the Bible says he was anointed and do you know the meaning of anointing so basically he must have he must have had a designation Christ to his name because Christ means the anointed one and he was called the anointed one but he lost it so he's no longer the anointed one praise the Lord but I'm just letting you know where he was just like you and I Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan after the father anointed him you know when he was baptized by John that was his anointing because the Bible lets us know that later on that the Bible lets us know that later on that how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power when did the Holy Spirit come upon him when he came out of the water the Bible says and when Jesus rose from the water the Holy Spirit alighted upon him and the father says this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased hear him he empowered him because you cannot hear or listen to somebody that does not have power over you remember the hierarchy thing that I'm talking to you about in fact let me say this I am I have the inclination by God and I know that necessity is placed upon me to teach more on this thing called spiritual warfare because the Bible says haven't done all to stand stand so that means I can't stand if I haven't done all to stand and one of the things that we need to do is understand spiritual hierarchy understand spiritual warfare by understanding spiritual positioning and so you need to know your rank where you stand and how to prepare i mean how to preserve your rank because a rank unpreserved is a rank that is lost but if you can preserve your rank the bible says he that is faithful and little to him much shall be given so if you're faithful at the level that you're at you will rise to another level it's called spiritual buoyancy don't worry when you listen to all these things again and you put it together it will make more sense but let's just go because of the sake of time I just want to introduce it but I'm not going to fully break it down today but we will pick up by the grace of God on Tuesday the Bible says that he weakened the nations why because when he stands in the glory that God has given to him the nations are weak compared to him you know when you see something that just weakens you the women in the house will understand you see a man that is tall dark and handsome and your knees become weak you know we use that expression don't worry, you don't need to be too spiritual. You know what I mean. Yeah. Verse 13. Yeah, Manuel Lydia says, get him. <laughs> like I told you, I hear things. For you have said in your heart, this is where it gets interesting. Verse 13. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. <laughs> I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make, I will be like the most high. Everything that he wanted to do, he wanted to do for himself. Every time Satan comes to tempt you, Satan is always offering you something for yourself. There is no temptation that comes without a promise to do something for self. He said to Jesus, oh, feed yourself. Turn the stones into bread. Jesus is not full for that. He took Jesus to a very high mountain. He says, look at all the kingdoms of the world. He did not say that I will give them to your followers. He did not say that I will give them to your heavenly father because already he knows everything belongs to the heavenly father. He says, I will give them to you. Temptation or what the Bible calls the deceitfulness of sin always comes with a promise to do something for self. If you can understand that, 
then it becomes very difficult for the enemy to tempt you and make you fall. When he told the woman, if you would eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, it will make you wise. And you shall become like God. Whenever Satan comes to tempt you, and he comes like an angel of light, and he's speaking to you in a dream, or speaking to you as I am speaking to you, guess what? Ask yourself, how does this thing give God glory? How does this thing bless my neighbor? How does this thing bring justice to my friends? If those questions cannot be answered and you are the primary beneficiary of that thing, it is not of God. The way by which you can expose Satan all the time is that Satan is always coming with the I agenda, something for you. He came to Jesus, I will give you the kingdoms of this world. He came to Jesus, throw yourself down and the angels will guide and catch you. It is always about you. When you break it down and you start to take temptations that, fa that you are faced with on a daily basis. Have you said no to certain drugs that you used to take while you were in the world? And Satan still tempts you with those things today? What does he tell you? He reminds you of how it makes you feel. But if you can think for a moment how it makes your spouse feel when you're high, you will not do it. If you think about how it makes God feel when you are speaking dial because you are under the influence of some kind of drug, will you take it? No, you will not. But when you think only about how it makes you feel and what you get out of it all day long, you are falling like Satan fell. The next time you want to leave that church, ask yourself, why am I leaving? Is it because of something that I am going to get out of it? Satan will tell you, oh, they don't even respect you in that church. They don't treat you nice. It's all about you feeling better. But if you would ask yourself, my leaving, what will he do? What will it do to this person that sees me as an example of a believer? What will he do to the leadership of the church who has come to lean on me because of the fact that I do this in service and I do that in service? When you put it in perspective of what your existence means to the kingdom of God, to the glory of God and to others, temptation now becomes nothing. The reason why Jesus was able to overcome all of those temptations was he never made anything about himself. He made it about the Father. I can be hungry as long as the Father is pleased. I'm good. I may have nothing but these sandals. But as long as the Heavenly Father is pleased with me. He just told me only 40 days ago that he was pleased with me. So what else do I need? I don't need the kingdoms of this world if the Lord is pleased with me. And lastly, what did Jesus tell Satan? And man, the leader reminded us, reminded us of that. The Bible says that man was made that he may worship God. And so no matter what the devil tempts you with, the devil will tell you to do things. The devil will come with ambition. Ambition was the reason why he fell. Everything was about him. The devil will be like, oh, do you know that if you leave that place and you start doing your own thing before you know what's going on, you're going to be this, you're going to be that. Let me tell you something. The devil cannot make you anything. Only the Lord is the maker of all things. When the devil told the woman, it's going to make you wise. Was that even a wise thing to do? Disobeying God is not wise. Because the devil cannot make anybody anything. Of course, he can make you fall. Because that's all he's got. Falling is all he, got, all he has. Because but the Bible says that by the time the heavens and the earth pass away, when time stops and eternity begins across all the realms, what is the description of where Satan is? The Bible says he will be thrown into the bottomless pit. He will keep falling. That's all he has. He's been falling from the beginning. This is just a detour. Once this is removed, he's going to keep falling. And he wants to take you with him. So I want to beg you in the name of Jesus to examine your heart and pay attention to the things of I. The things of self, those things that please the body, those things that please the ego, those things that satisfy the eyes. And the next time before you make a move that is all about you, ask yourself the question, how is this pleasing to my heavenly father? How is this beneficiary to my neighbor? How is this beneficiary to those who haven't even met me? When they meet me, what credentials am I going to present? Will I present the credential of the one that keeps falling and falling and falling? Or will I present the credential of someone who is standing at the plow and not looking back? 
when you put those things in perspective, guess what? What does the devil have? Nothing. Understanding spiritual warfare can be summarized in your ability to be able to resist the devil that he may flee from you. Every soldier that you are faced with in spiritual warfare is an avatar of Satan. Every force that you will deal with is working for Satan. So if you can defeat Agent Smith, you don't have to worry about the bus driver. That is an inside one for those people who have seen The Matrix. You see, because those people are not your enemies. You've seen the movie The Matrix. That bus driver is not your enemy. That bus driver just wants to drive you from this bus stop to the other bus stop. But he can be possessed by Agent Smith at any time. My mom said this many years ago and it's still true till today. She said every human being that you see is like a chicken that is in the devil's cage. At any point in time, he can grab them and use them for whatever he wants. And so that is the reason why you have to make sure that you are able to defeat and overcome Satan at all time. If you know how to deal with Satan at all time, you will never have to worry about another human being. Because when they come, they come as agents of Satan. To lie, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But if you've already known how to take care of the force that is behind them, you will be able to love all men and be at peace with all men because you've taken care of the one who powers them. That evil machine that is called Satan. I'm going to pray for you today from Isaiah chapter 7. It's a very dangerous prayer. And the reason why I say it's a very dangerous prayer is it can be quite intoxicating. But you need to know that it is one of the powers that is available to you to be able to withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. Anybody there yet? In fact, let me save that one perhaps for Tuesday. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 57. Hmm. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay, good. I was just waiting to get that release. Isaiah 7. We're going to pray from verse 2. And what does it say? It says, And it was told to the house of David, saying, Serious forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. The emphasis here is that the army and the forces of Syria are deployed where? In Ephraim. Joseph had two children. One of them is called Manasseh or Manasseh and the other one is called Ephraim. Manasseh means to forget. But Ephraim means to be fruitful. The devil does not assemble his army if there is no fruit. So, temptations are a good indication that you're about to come into your fruitful season. I told you it's a very dangerous prayer because it can be intoxicating. The next time you see temptation, some of us, even rather than quoting scriptures, we just start to dance. It's okay, but make sure after dancing, you quote scriptures. You understand what I mean? You see, Jesus was about to get into his fruitful season. The reason why the Holy Spirit came upon him is so that he can go about doing good, healing all manners of diseases, setting the captives free. But temptation is the doorway to fruition. To be fruitful is to be Ephraim. And that's where the army of Syria was camping. And so the prayer that I want to say over you, that I want you to also say over yourself, is that the Lord would allow for you to see temptation as promotion. You see, because like I told you, the reason why we don't make the effort sometimes is because we don't believe. If we believe that the word of God is the only way by which we can have good success by meditating on it and speaking it and believing and operating in everything that it says, guess what we're going to do? We will study it, we will meditate on it, and we will do all that is in there. 
Because now we believe. If you would truly believe that temptation holds the key to promotion. Because when temptation comes, it offers you a voice different from the voice of God. Choosing not to obey that voice puts you above that thing, no matter how high that thing is. It is a stepping stone for your promotion. Because it's come to announce that you have come to the outposts of Ephraim. Your fruitfulness is the reason why the devil comes. The devil is not, I mean, you can't be a sophisticated robber that puts together a team of experts like Ocean Eleven just to go and rob somebody who has no money. No, you stage such a heist when there is a prize, when there is treasure. So guess what? Rejoice. That's why the Bible says we rejoice in tribulation. Because one of the things that we have known is that whenever the enemy brings a temptation. So let me break it down to things that happen to you and I every day. The Lord says, Laura, you need to fast tomorrow. And Laura is like, oh, I'm going to fast tomorrow when I wake up. And then she wakes up. And then her husband who never brews coffee decides to, boo boost, to brew the best coffee that morning. An Arabica coffee of multi-origin. And the smell of it comes. I am like, ah. Oh, God, can I start this fast on Sunday instead of Monday? And the Lord is saying, no. I said, do it today. So what does that mean? It means that you have now been offered an opportunity to be promoted, to rise, if you would say no to that voice. Every single day that we're faced with temptation like that, if we choose to say no, we go higher. Because obedience is how you rise of all in the kingdom. So let us pray. If I let us break bread as we pray. Okay, praise the Lord. The Lord's giving me the go ahead to do that 57.12. We will make that Isaiah 57.12 our breaking bread prayer. But we're still going to pray Isaiah chapter 7 that we just read, verse 2. So 57.12. This one requires a bit of explaining, but I think I've explained it before. So if you remember it, great. That saves us time. It says in Isaiah 57.12, I will declare your righteousness and your works. I will declare your righteousness and your works for they will not profit you. So, you know, I told you, you need three or four scriptures to explain the difference between works and works. This is the middle scripture. You need to find one before it and the one after it. I just keep giving you these answers. Anyway, so now as we break bread today, I want you to say this. The works of our own hands the things that we do because we believe in us they don't help us it is only the things that we do because we believe in him that makes the difference if I say that I am going to fast because I believe that I I can do without eating that means I am believing in my own ability but if I say that I will fast because the Lord is my strength then that gives him glory so as we take the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus today in remembrance of him, I want you to remember that you don't need any good works to qualify you for the body and the blood of Jesus. Some people don't take it sometimes because they're like, oh, I've been bad all day. I've been back all week. I've not been praying. I've been sinning. I can't take the blood. Let me tell you something. Nothing cleanses you other than the blood. Maybe you even need this bread and the blood more than I do, more than someone else's does. So don't let the devil lie to you that you're not qualified to partake of the Lord's body. The Lord's body and his blood is what qualifies us to partake of heaven and to partake of the breast of the El Shaddai himself. And so I want to encourage you, don't miss out on this opportunity to reconnect with the Lord and to engage the Lord. Do it prayerfully. As it is our custom here, most of us will close our eyes when we break bread because we know that we are communing with the Lord Jesus by his Holy Spirit and so as you take the body and the blood of Jesus today I want you to say father I agree with you in renouncing my works even my works of righteousness because you have renounced my works of righteousness you have declared it filthy rags before you help me to do the works of righteousness that come by faith the things that I do, let them do because I believe that you are my savior. That I believe that you are the one that has mercy upon my soul. That I believe that you, in your faithfulness, will lift me every time out of the merry clay when I call upon you. 
Father, I need to believe in you. So as you take off the body and the blood of Jesus today, ask him to help your unbelief. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Now as we take the blood of Jesus, I want you to be confident that God is for you and not against you. He said, I will help you to overcome the enemy. So he's with you. You're not fighting alone. So every time the temptation seems tough, just call him and he will answer. Trust more in the blood than in your own brawn. You may drink of the blood. So very quickly, I'm going to just pray over you. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 2 that we have just read. That the spirit of wisdom will rest mightily upon you. That your discernment will be sharp. That when the enemy comes, your eyes will be open to see through the facade of the angel of light. To see the degenerate spirit that he has become so that that way you are not falling for the antiques of the enemy in this season that we are going to it is even more important for you to recognize your season and to apply your heart to understanding I pray for you that in this season nothing will be too dear to your heart to lay aside for the sake of spending time with God and spending time in his word. We have come to a season of equipping. It is a short season, says the Lord. He said it is but a few days. He says, but many things will happen in righteousness to those who are faithful, to those who will make the time to sit at my feet, says the Lord. There is a beat that is coming from the other side of the mountain. The Lord showed me a concordment of forces. And what they're doing is they are beating drums of different kinds. Some of them I recognize because the Lord's given me insight into some of the practices of the occult. So I know the meaning of these drums. These are drums that are being beaten to activate the warriors that have been positioned around us by Satan. They have been familiar spirits. We've become familiar with them. Some of them we have become so accustomed to their activities in our lives that we don't even know that they're not of God. But when this drum is heard by them, they will become activated. And so I have seen the drummers from the other side of the mountain and they're beating the drum. And the Lord is saying, before those that have been positioned around you become activated, you need to be activated in the Holy Spirit in the place of preparation. So, make the most of these few days that have been unloaded. Spend time, study the word, pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in tongues, build yourself up on your most holy faith. This is the time to do it. Pray in fervently with all manners of prayers. This is the time. Yes. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. By the Holy Spirit, I know that there is a release in this very moment of the spirit of supplication. Many of us do not, do not pray that prayer of supplication enough. Thank you, Lord. You know, at the beginning of this message, I read to us from the book of Matthew chapter 27, wherein it was talking about the fact that Jesus is bringing justice to victory. He is doing that. A bruised reed, he will not break. A smoldering flax, he will not quench until he has delivered justice to victory. And the Lord is saying, Many of us need to recognize the place of supplication. Supplication, it simply means a humbled prayer. A prayer that you say simply to take yourself out of the way and let the Lord move. I pray for you that you will receive this spirit of supplication so that you will pray for yourself to decrease and the Lord to increase. 
you will learn how to pray your doubts out of the way and pray your fears out of the way so that you may be able to receive help from the Lord. Many of us are too responsible in our minds for ourselves that we're not receiving help from God as we should. He says, if you know what it means that the Lord desires mercy, he desires to show mercy than to receive sacrifice. You will humble yourself before the Lord and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. You will say, Lord, it is not by my power, nor by my might, but it is by your Holy Spirit. Help me to receive your help. Help me, Lord, to receive you as my help. In the season that we're in, the Lord says, if it's going to fall, let it fall. They have to fall if you would rise. Let me say that and explain exactly what I am seeing. I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, Holy Spirit, what is the marching command for this moment? And they said to me, let it fall. A couple of months ago, about two months ago, the Lord showed me a vision and I shared it with you all that I see things falling out of heaven and as they fall, the saints were rising. Some of you, you're too busy like Martha. You're trying to stop things from falling. You don't want this relationship to fall. Yeah, this relationship has become very delicate. If they call me and I don't answer the phone, they will think I'm proud. If they, if they say they want to come to my house and I said I'm not available, they're going to say, oh, you're too bushy. Let me tell you something. Some of those relationships have to fall so that you can rise. Some of us are too busy paying bills. Let me tell you something. I'm not teaching you to be irresponsible. I'm only teaching you to let God take responsibility for you. Certain things have to fall. Certain things have to go. Because if you want to attend to everything that looks important, you will never have time for the things of God. Because Satan has a way of making everything look important. Martha was concerned about all these things. But what did Jesus say? He says, Martha, Martha, you're bothered about all these things. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that part. Let some of those things fall so that you can rise in this season. So I want to encourage you folks. Spend time with the Lord. Seek his face. Converse with him as a friend. Speak to him often. Speak to him often and ask for his help freely. And it will help you. Father, in the matter name of Jesus, I thank you. You see, the Lord said to me, the reason why he took me around talking about the waters today was because those specific words have to be spoken in this place. It wasn't about the tuition as much as it is about the deliverance. Praise the Lord. And the Lord has allowed for me to speak those words, his words, about the water from above and the water from beneath because he wants to quench your thirst. If you drink the water from the ocean, you will still thirst because of the salt that is in it. And that is the reason why many of us have been drinking from the world from businesses, from, from, from monetary systems, and we're still thirsty. And that's because we have not drawn from the well of living water. And so today, the Lord is doing a surgical work upon your heart to allow for you to trust in him more than you trust in the world. Drink from the water that he gives. He says, if only you know the one who says to you, give me the drink. He says, you will quickly come to him and say, you give me living water so that I will not thirst again. God is asking for you to come, not because he wants you to bless him, but because he wants to bless you. It is time to drink from the fountain of life. I want to challenge you this week. Identify something that needs to go. Make room, be intentional. Identify one thing this week. I say this week, this thing, goes this coming week it goes i am intentionally letting go of this to make room for more of god father we thank you because once again we have been with you and you have ministered to us you have given your word and your word has healed us now i want you all to rise and this perhaps will be the last thing that we do today this was something that the Holy Spirit brought, brought to my attention very expressly as very needed. This is a message, not just for those of us who are in here, primarily for those of us who are in here, but some of you, you know certain people who are truly seeking after God, 
who are truly thirsty for the righteousness of the kingdom, I give you the liberty to share this with them also. The Holy Spirit says, it is time to start the fountain. The Bible says, out from your belly shall flow the rivers of living waters. But many of us, we have gone through several seasons of not drawing from that well. It is time for that fountain to be restarted. And how do you restart the fountain of life? It is by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the inducer of that flow. When it comes upon you, the wind of heaven, and it fills you, it allows for the water to flow. It's like a pump. You push air into a pipe and it pumps water from, for you on the other side. And that is why you need the Holy Spirit in this season. So the Holy Spirit, it is time, is saying it is time for the fountain to be restarted, which means it is time for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. It is time for the fire to come upon the meat. It is time for the Holy Ghost to come upon the offering. It is time for him to visit the sacrifice. It is time for him to take his place. Say, Holy Spirit, I need you. Fill me, Holy Spirit. For out of my belly shall flow rivers of living waters. I need you for there to be a flow. Mebekus in the bikus mebekus ma mebekus kia ma mebekus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If you believe that not you but the Lord does these things, He will do it for you today. Ask the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Ask that the wind of heaven will fill you in the mighty name of Jesus. The words have been spoken, your heart has heard it. Now receive the fullness of your miracle. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let me tell you something. As I am praying for the Holy Spirit to come, I am allowed by God to see the fountains. Do you know that one of the first people that I saw was John? He's not even here. But then I see John and I see from the fountain of his heart, a word is brewing in his spirit that needs to come to this house. You see, so this thing is already beginning. I want you to tap into that grace also and say, Holy Spirit, out from my belly shall flow the rivers. Fill me, Holy Spirit, so that this water of life will flow. Fill me, Holy Spirit, so that this water of life will flow. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the abundance of your grace, for the faithfulness of your word, and the potency of faith. May we continue to rise by obeying only you. <laughs> Holy Ghost. I'm going to pray for somebody here real quick. And I want everybody else to listen to this prayer. Um, Lord, I want to pray for you for your eyes to be open. You see, there is a place of authority that is there for you in God, but you have to see it to be able to walk in it. You see what I mean? The Bible says, and I keep quoting the scripture today because it is heaven's method for delivery. The Bible says that a bruised reed, it will not break. The flax that is already smoldering, the light is, the flame is already out. The smoke is about to be quenched. The Bible says he will not quench it. He will do it with such gentility, but yet with much authority. You see what I mean? And so the place of authority that the Lord has for you is such that you do not have to be in a debate with anybody. You just have to speak. Speak and let the word of God do the job. Speak and be on your way. Speak shake the dust off your feet and be on your way just speak that's where the lord has you operating in but he wants you to see it he wants you to see the potency of his word that comes from your mouth you are not the one they know you are the one that god knows and you need to know what god knows paul said that i may know as i am known and ask him he says ask of me i will show you you know, specifically, God wants you to ask him about you. He says, ask me about my sons and the things to come. Ask about your next level. 
Ask him to show you. Let him reveal to you what that next level looks like. So when you see yourself beginning to operate at that next level, then immediately you will know how to comport yourself in this one. And that goes for every single one of us. One of the ways by which I have been able to allow myself to enjoy promotion is by letting God show me the me of tomorrow. And then I'm like, man, is that me? Yeah, then I need to pull myself together. You see what I mean? And so I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that as the Lord has raised you to be an example, to receive this word, that you will truly have the fruits to show for it in righteousness. Your words carry power because the Lord has put his word in your mouth. And you will begin to see life's changed. You see, you may not have thought of yourself to be this, but the Lord is showing you to me as an evangelist. Someone who is meant to sow the seed of the word of God that will begin the work of conviction in the life of many. And through you, many will come to the foot of the cross. I am telling you, it is going to happen. I see many people at the foot of the cross and they all, have, they all have this inscription between them by Laura. They were invited by you. The Lord has made you a signpost to bring others in. But even you would not be left on the side of the road. Like Paul said, he says, I haven't ministered to others. God forbid that I myself become a castaway. Therefore, I put my body under. Let us put under everything that is of us that we may be able to manifest all things that are of him. In the mighty name of Jesus. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. And all I needed, your great hands have provided. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the showers. Oh, the drizzles have come. Thank you, Jesus. We do not take them for granted. But Lord, now we are waiting and ready for the showers. Hey, it is the season of the showers. Holy Ghost. Oh, mercy drops around us have fallen. But for the showers we seek, showers of blessings. You see, let me tell you something. If you would see the beauty of what the Lord has for us, the Holy Spirit does not engage in futility. If he is pruning and preparing us, it's because we have come to Ephraim, the place of fruitfulness. And great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Thank God for his mercy. I want you to just say, Lord, have mercy on me. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly and I will be clean. Wash me with his soap and I'll be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Father, I want to enjoy the fullness of your mercy. Bring on your mercy. Bring it on, Lord. Bring it on. Bring it on. Morning by morning. The mercies I see. You change not, and your compassion fails not. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. I want you to go home today and sing about God's faithfulness. Make up songs in your bedroom to the Lord to sing of His faithfulness. You know how many times the enemy tried to take you out before now, but you're still here, a believer. Sing of his faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. 
I want to encourage you this is a good moment to say Lord I want to start again Lord I'm, I'm about to turn a new leaf and take you the most seriously that I've ever taken you Lord because I know that to take you seriously is to actually live as though I love my life you see, not the kind of loving one's life to be self-centered and to be self-seeking, but to love you because, to love you because you first loved me. To embrace that love. And so if you're here today, at this particular moment, I don't want us to, I want us to be as reverent as we can be because the Holy Spirit is here. And he's the one that convicts the world of sin and of righteousness, he convicts the believer. I want you to say, Holy Spirit, have your way in me. I hear the invitation that you are offering me to draw closer to you. And I surrender all to you. I give everything to you. Whatever it is that has been keeping me from embracing you and chasing after you, I surrender. Into my heart come Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Heavenly Father come into my heart. Walk alongside with me. Only you can help me to make this new beginning right. Pray where you're at today and say that you're turning a new leaf so that at the end of the day, the Father may be glorified. And I surrender all. I Surrender all, all to Jesus, on to you, my blessed Savior. I surrender all, I surrender all to you, I surrender all. Surrender all to Jesus, all to you, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. God bless you, folks. If you can make it out on Tuesday, let us get more into these strategies for warfare. Let us learn together so that we can win together. There is victory for this company. God bless you.